Well, good morning. Welcome back to Funeral Planning 101. Uh, uh, I, I thought that was not what it was called. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. Final victory. Final yeah, yeah, victory. Yeah. That's, uh, that's what we're calling this. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally jacked it from... Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Death doctor and all, all these fun things. So um, it's good to, to have you all here. Does everyone have a, a copy of the sheet? Uh, I have a couple extra copies if, if anyone needs one. We're good? All right. Uh, as per our tradition, custom, uh, we'll begin with prayer. Uh, any, any prayer requests? I know uh, we'll lift up uh, Fred Willig and his family. Uh, Fred's brother passed away this weekend. Is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, my mother may be coming back. She's starting to have these little episodes. Yeah. Okay. What's, yeah. what's her name? Marge. Marge. Oh. Yay. 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 I've been, I've been asking a lot of people to pray for our uh, school families. A number of our school families are going through some messy situations. So just to lift up our, our school families up in prayer. Uh, I've had, had a couple of difficult conversations with a couple of kids over the last couple of weeks. So, um, so prayers for them. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and begin with prayer. <clears throat> Uh, Dear Lord God, uh, we thank you for uh, this day and thank you for allowing us to come together to uh, to talk about uh, kind of a a dark uh, topic, uh, death, but uh, to also talk about the hope that we have as Christians and that uh, death is not the end of the story, that uh, you sent your son uh, who died himself, but also conquered death in his uh, resurrection and that he has given uh, the same victory over the over death uh, in our future resurrection. Uh, We come before you with with many uh, prayer requests. We lift up uh, Fred and his family uh, as they mourn the loss of his brother. Uh, we also continue to pray for the Westfall family uh, as they mourn the loss of Ryan. Uh, we lift up uh, those with various health concerns, Marge and Paul uh, and anyone else uh, on our hearts and minds at this time. Uh, we also lift up our country, a lot of unrest and uh, anxiety and all sorts of uh, messy things going on. We ask that you would bring peace and justice to our, to our nation and that, uh, that your church would continue to look to your son uh, in the midst of all the chaotic, chaotic things going around. And a prayer of uh, Thanksgiving, we, we uh, give you thanks for 42 years of uh, marriage to Alan and Vita uh, that uh, continue to bless them and thank you for the many blessings that you've given them uh, in their marriage. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, uh, we got roughly halfway through, or two-fifths of the way through, uh, this uh, our, our opening lesson last week, talking about uh, death, but also uh, the practical notes of, you know, thinking about our funerals and, and starting to uh, plan them to, to some extent. Um, any, uh, any remarks or thoughts or questions from some of the stuff we talked about last week. Arlene says, let's go. Oh, all right, yeah. we're, we're moving. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, we, we started off just a brief recap. Uh, no, you're supposed to go, <laughs> oh. she said to go. Um, yeah. We started off with Psalm 116, where it says, How precious uh, in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Uh, We talked a bit about that. Uh, How is 
that's kind of a, an ironic statement um, in that uh, death is a bad thing, um, but God works good in death. But also juxtaposing that with uh, the uh, events where Jesus, before Jesus raises Lazarus from, from the dead, where he, Jesus weeps over Lazarus' death. And so um, kind of pitting these two things together, what, is, what does this mean? And then we moved into uh, understanding death, having a Christian understanding of death. And death, of course, is a result of sin. Uh, the wages of sin is death. Uh, so uh, we are constantly um, wreaked, racked with death um, uh, because, because of sin. <clears throat> uh, so today uh, we're going to move into Jesus' death. And uh, the Bible verse I have here is Isaiah 25, 7 through 9. So let's go ahead and turn there. All right, Isaiah 25, verses 7 through 9. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Thus far, or this is the text. Hallelujah. <laughs> right, this is uh, an Easter reading. And this is, uh, this is one of my favorite Old Testament readings. The, the more that I've kind of encountered it, um, the, more, the, 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 the more I appreciate it. So I'm just wondering how many of you are familiar with this reading Prior to this morning, a few of us. A lot of notes on this. <laughs> okay, you want to share? Well, I just, I, you know, I know I do, but it's interesting that translation is so different than the NIV. Oh, is it? Quite different. Okay. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, the one that I guess it, it, the most is not understanding that one. Mm -hmm. Verse nine. This uses the word trusted. Surely, this is our God. We trusted in. Mm. And yours is waited. Mm -hmm. And I see that as totally two different things. Mm. How so? Well, I wait for Pam all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I trust she's going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I just see it as two diff completely different words. Yeah, but it just. Or wait and not trust. But if you're just waiting, there may be. There's. Maybe there's hopelessness in just waiting. Then why wait? Because it's waiting on the Lord. Yeah. And so I, I don't know. That just that's what struck me. Right or wrong, that's what that hit me. Wait and trust are two different sure. things. <laughs> that reminds me of when I was in a sociology class in college. They uh, the professor asked us to divide up our life however you would want to, and I did it on, in terms of waiting. Like when you're little, waiting to be old enough, tall enough to turn the light on and off, get your own drink of water, waiting to get your driver's license, waiting to do, you know, so whatever that's what he liked it. Yeah. So. I, well, that's what came to mind, and I think, Amy, you, you, you've touched on this. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say a couple weeks ago when we were talking about uh, patience, I forget what section it was, so I'm not going to go to the Bible yet, but um, we, it was in James. Yeah, we were in James, we were talking about being patient. Well, I, I, was, I just came across this uh, quote on Monday from Jonathan Fisk. Some of you love Jonathan Fisk. Some of you don't know who he is. Some of you don't like Jonathan Fisk. You remember? Okay, so. He's, a, uh, he's, he's an LCMS <laughs> pastor. He's an LCMS pastor. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Uh, she, yeah. It's good that you forgot that you maybe you don't care for him. So uh, he, he writes that, uh, and I don't know if he got this, if, if he came up with this on his own. He says, patience is the hard believing that doing nothing 
is more powerful than doing something. And uh, he says patience is an outgrowth of trust. So um, he says the, the definition of an impatient person then by contrast is a person who lives an entire life without trust. So I, I think that's, and you touched on it, Paul, I think you made the connection. I, I think there is a direct connection between waiting and trust. It's because for us as Christians, the, the question is not, is, is not about waiting. All of us have to wait for something, but how do we wait? Because I can wait, and in fact, I'm terrible at waiting. I mean, ask my kids. Um, I, I hate waiting for them on stuff. And I, think, I don't know if that's too strong a word, and I repent of it. Um, but I think there's that trust. Well, look, it's not working out how I want, but if I trust that God uses all things, and then at least in the ESV translation of Psalm 27, verse 14, wait for the Lord, uh, be strong and let your heart take courage, wait for the Lord. So I think that is, uh, you know, in, in some sense, all of us are waiting to die. But how do we wait? Because I could wait with, well, I could just say, I'm not going to wait any longer. I'll just get it over with. Um, but I'm trusting that God is using all things. I saw Rick, you had your hand up. Well, uh, I, I sympathize with what Paul's saying about wait. Wait is one of those words that has multiple meanings and multiple connotations. And all, I, I don't think it's good to support Scripture by looking at secular writings. And one of the ideas that occurred to me was Tennyson finds they also serve to only stand and wait. They're waiting to serve. They're, they're expecting <laughs> but it's just the idea of, you know, waiting is like an idleness mm. to me. You know, that's not all it is. No, no. But that, I did, that's the thought that came forward with this is you're waiting, you're just I, I'm idle, I'm just, you know, wait to get picked up. I'm be, just being there. passive. I could be doing something else, but yeah. I'm just going to wait. Yeah. You know, I don't know where you're coming from. Yeah. And it's just <laughs> that type of thing, you know. But I know that. The, Wait on the Lord and mm-hmm. just be that patient. That makes all kinds of sense too. I looked up the uh, the word, the Hebrew word. Uh, for all you Hebrew scholars, it's uh, I think koa <laughs> koa ko- ko- uh, whatever. Your pronunciation, ko- ko- whatever ko- it is, your pronunciation is terrible. Uh, I, 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 I am the Hebrew way. scholar. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got a B in Hebrew, so um, it shows. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> The, the the program does it all for me. So uh, except pronounce it. Uh, uh, the the word the way it defines this word is wait for, endure, remain, await, um, wait. So there's this uh, kind of this endure, remaining kind of aspect to this this specific word, uh, which in this context, especially with the wait for the Lord kind of idea, it's it's not just a kind of an idle. I'm just going to be passive, being lazy or slothful or whatever it might be, but a, uh, a faithful waiting uh, on God. Uh, and especially in this context, there's a waiting um, talking about, uh, well, talking about death and specifically that God is going to put an end to death. He's going to conquer death. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah. Well, I, I think it, it takes, I think this is what Fisk is getting to, it, it takes faith to wait. And, and doing, being passive is sometimes more difficult. And I, I think we see this organizationally. I see this in my own life. Sometimes I'm inclined, to, if I just do the first thing that comes to mind, sometimes that can be terrible. Um, sometimes it takes, it takes faith for me to be patient. Like I could hardly wait for Paul to stop talking so I could talk, right? But that doesn't help him or me um, or you. So I think that is where, okay, we're going to wait, but it's not just pointless waiting. It's waiting because we trust that the one who is the planner, who, is, who does the saving verbs, will actually do this in the best way. And, and boy, that, that is very difficult. So, I mean, um, imagine if only Eve had waited, maybe and consulted Adam, or he had said, Eve, wait, uh, because God said, you don't need to do this yet. So I think that is, there, there's that tension between it's difficult to do nothing, but sometimes waiting 
is the best thing to do. Sometimes we don't have the luxury of waiting. And, and then we could use uh, St. John Wooden, who says, be quick, but don't hurry. Whatever that means. I'm still figuring it out. Rick, Rick Kerr. Because when I first, when I read these verses, I'm looking at what they're waiting for, and, and we could identify it as waiting for God to deliver me, but at the time that this was written, the people were waiting for the fulfillment of the promise. They were waiting for the visible Messiah, and today we wait for the visible return of Jesus. And so if I read those passages that wait, in it, and it, he said on that day, behold, we have waited for save us, it's not that I'm waiting for him to get me out of this one day predicament, but I am waiting for him to the ultimate end, where that's where it'll be, and I don't know that this is messianic this early in Isaiah, but that's that's the way it strikes me when I look at it. So it's it's more about the, the one for whom you are waiting or trusting in, more so than me. Yeah, right. So it's more about God than us. Surely. <laughs> I'm also thinking, too, that while you're waiting, you, you don't wait for this one thing. It's kind of like Jesus said, the only thing is that you know, waiting is one thing is that to come. You have many good things to do here on earth. You know, like you quoted, uh, while we wait, waiting to trust, well, we're waiting to do the works that we were sent to. There's there's a there's a bunch of possibilities of what you can do while you wait, and and none of us, um, in 2020, many of us at least don't lack anything because the first thing that many of us are probably inclined to do during any idle time is have no idle time, and I'll just play Candy Crush or whatever. Now I'm actually into Duolingo, uh, Padre. So, uh, si. so yeah, yeah, <laughs> si, Senor. Uh, but <clears throat> I, I think it is like they. they the waiting can be pointless. The waiting can be counterproductive, but it's always about the object. And so the ob- in whom do we place our trust? Who does the saving verbs? Who is the hero of the story? And when, when Isaiah is saying, or God is saying through Isaiah, behold, check it out, looky here, this is our God. We've waited for him that he might save us. Or we've trusted in him. Because it's the same, I think it's the same in the same domain. We've trusted in him. He is faithful to his promise. He is the rock that cannot, that shall not be moved. And, and then we've waited for him, and it goes from good to great. So let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And, and so, and, and I think just at the beginning of that text, that it just, and I, and I think there's actually, there's more to the, there's a, when it talks about the mountain, mm-hmm. it says there's going to be a feast. Yeah, well verse, aged. verse six and seven. Um, incidentally, I see we have people joining us online. My my mom is on here. Um, my mom enjoys wine. Anybody else here enjoy wine? Uh, yeah, a few people. Yeah. So, because uh, it's verse six that says, "On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well aged wine, of of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined." Like that's pretty cool. That there's actually stuff to do. And we, when we talked early on about it's not just dying and going to heaven or being a disembodied spirit. You need a body in order to eat, I think. And then it's about enjoying it, and you're not just alone. And then this, the, the beauty of um, what's God going to do? In, he's going to swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. And Lord, have mercy, I think, as, as you alluded to, Dennis, and as we prayed, Lord, have mercy because there's a darkness that, that a shadow that is over things. And it's not just limited to Kenosha, Wisconsin, or Seattle, or Portland, or downtown Indianapolis. There's a shadow that each of it that's kind of over us. And yet we say, in the end, the darkness will not win out. So I'm, boy, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of alluding to what Rick was saying earlier, that, that this, well, this is a messianic uh, uh, prophecy. So this is uh, a lot of times prophecies have multiple layers. Um, so on the one hand, Isaiah is talking about, uh, well, there might be like an immediate context that Isaiah is speaking to, but it also is talking about the first coming of Jesus, 
but it's also looking forward to the second coming of Jesus, especially those verses that you just read, Pastor Troy, um, this, uh, this feasting and that when, when Christ returns and we enter the new creation, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be like the best feast that we could. And we get a imagine. taste of it, the now and the not yet. We yeah. even sing about it. This is the feast of victory for our God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Um, for the lamb who was slain has begun his reign. He's begun it. I mean, he's reigning now, but the best is still to come. And then that's where like verse eight is so explicit. He will swallow up death forever. Is it swallowed up now? No, because we continue to bury the people we love. And unless Jesus comes back first, eventually you're going to be buried. So plan your funeral. Uh, but then this is the promise. And this is, this comes out in revelation. We see Jesus in some sense doing this in the gospels that the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. Oh, and we, we talked about this last week about Jesus weeping. And it, why is he weeping? Is he weeping because people don't get it? or is he, I think he's weeping because he's sad. That was my, I mean, um, the reproach, the shame of all people, he will take away. And he says, for the Lord has spoken. Whatever the Hebrew, what is the word? What's the Hebrew for that, Pastor Dave? Uh, the Lord has spoken. I don't, Something I mean, I, guttural. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, I bet uh, people, especially in the, yeah, in the internet, enjoyed my that. Yeah. sounds. Um, there. I also uh, wanted to, to note out, to, to point out that, um, you know, Rick, Rick redirected it, who, who, who is the object of our waiting or trust? Uh, it's the Lord of hosts. And you notice the Lord here is often in the Old Testament is all caps. Uh, that is a reference to uh, the personal name of God, Yahweh. And whenever uh, the Old Testament writers invoke the name of Yahweh, you know, think about what all Yahweh has done for the people of Israel already. Yahweh is the Lord of hosts who brought his people up out of Egypt. Yahweh is the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who gave them these promises, who has made them his people. It's the same Yahweh who has already done these amazing things for his people that is going to conquer death, who's going to swallow it up for his people. Yes. Yeah. All. And oh, and then he says he will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. So I think uh, give everyone a chance. Or... I think that's uh, the the key there is that he says his people. Um, yeah. So th this is a good uh, lesson in why we don't take verses out of context because uh, we can just pluck this verse out and then make it say whatever we want it to. We have the rest of scripture to interpret this um, and that uh, not everyone is going to uh, go to heaven to be with God forever. Um, Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. They're, believing in Jesus is the only way to be resurrected to eternal life with God. Um, <clears throat> so to wipe tears from all faces, I think we can say is a reference to all faces of God's people. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, I think any Easter text is a good funeral text. Uh, there's just the richness, and, and it, for me at least, it ties all the stuff together. And um, one of the things, and I, I know I've said it quite a few times, but it just it resonates more and more, is when we think about 
what it means, the ultimate means that he's going to swallow up death forever, that he's going to take the shame away. It is as if it never happened. It, it's not that, well, I remember when I had all these, this pain in my life. It's just he's going to undo all the sad things. He, so um, it's, this is talking about life after life after death. And it, it's just that it's an awesome thing, but also it is that, that life, it, we are meant to live in the body. It's just that our bodies are shot through with sin. All of creation is. Uh, the book of Revelation actually quotes this text uh, at least twice. Uh, one of them used for the epistle reading for Ryan Westfall's funeral on Sunday where God will wipe away the tears, uh, will wipe away our tears. So Revelation quotes this a couple of times at least. Is that seven? Seven and 20 well, 14, 14 okay. probably 20, multiple times. So It's the All Saints Day reading, mm -hmm. that, the one, yeah. Margo. What I thought about in 8B and the reproach of his people and he will take away from all the earth, and I actually just looked up the exact definition of reproach, the expression of disapproval or disappointment. And so often, I know, I feel like I'm disappointed God. I mean, do this and that, and you need to do this, and you all so disappoint him. And to think that he's taking that away is just um, wasteful. Like, his people will be taken away from all the earth. And I just love the image, and I think it's going to be a literal. I don't. I don't know that this is just a metaphor, but I think this is really going to. God the Father, like a parent with his child, is going to wipe those tears away, physically. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was there like a Johnson and Johnson, no more tears commercial or something? Oh, I was thinking about going to wipe that. Gray right out of my is that what that was? I know it was hair coat. Yeah, I, I kind of can I have a tendency to conflate this stuff. Uh, so anyway, no more tears. Yeah, there's a sermon in there, I'm sure. I don't know, but I think I, I don't know. Yeah, no, it may, it may, because in the resurrection, I don't know that anybody has gray hair. I don't know, although that it does talk about honoring those who have gray hair. Or so, there's no sore knees in the resurrection, so. But yeah, yeah, or no, yeah. You, well, we talked about, yeah. So. <laughs> no more tears is also an Ozzy Osbourne song. So. Or what? You would know that, Pastor Luke. Uh, that was before. Anyway, yeah. last time I joked about when you were a Baptist, and now you, you, you anyway. So right. yeah. that's, that's really a deep vision of heaven. Ultimately, the resurrection. It's not that I will be there going, wow, I'm glad there's no gossip here and there's no bad people and there's this that I won't even remember there ever was mm -hmm. gossip. No. And it's an incredible blessing that all yeah. of those things that we live now to forget, we won't even have the opportunity to forget them in eternity because we won't remember that they were ever there. God is going to undo it all. And the disgrace is removed. Now, all of, that doesn't mean my mind will be wiped blank and I won't know things of this earth, but it's all of that disgrace, all of that sin that is that is just done. That's a that's an incredible blessing to consider that not only will it not be there, but we won't even remember it if it was here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to to remove the reproach. I mean all the reproach. All the junk. Sometimes I think about when I get to heaven I'm gonna to apologize to this person about <laughs> this or that. And then I think no need, you know, it's, it's all taken care of. Well, and uh, to bring it back to, to the text, I'm going to pull Rick's move to bring us back to the text. Um, Some kind of nerve to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, that God is going to swallow up death. Um, Believe it or not. Yes. But how does God do this? He did this by dying himself or sending his son who died uh, on the cross. Jesus, Jesus himself died. I mean, you th I mean Jesus's death, I mean, I, I keep saying these kind of things, is a big deal. God died. 
Um, Jesus conquers death by dying himself. Well, and, and, and I think so. So d- it all goes back to the beginning. Genesis 3.15 is the first gospel. There's a curse, but then God says, I will reverse the curse. And it, and it is as if it, it, I mean, so Satan has nothing left, not even a scar. And, and you alluded to this, Rick Kerr, but, and I think you, you also, Margo, um, that it won't even be a hint of like even a little scratch. Oh, yeah, that was a bad thing. Nothing. It's, it's like, Satan, you will have nothing left. Because it is swallowed up, and I, and I, it's it's almost unbelievable, but but I think the truth is, and this is life in the church. So all those sins that dog you, that when you come to church and you hear that, that you hear the pastor say, and by the stead and command, in the stead and command of Christ, I forgive you all your sin. It's believe it or not, your sins are forgiven because God forgets. I mean, it, 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 God, God says it's gone. We have difficulty believing and trusting in that, but in the resurrection, I mean, it is gone. And, and I think that segues into this comment that you have, or this poll quote that you have here, Pastor Luke from yeah, Pastor so, Wolfmuller. So I, I pulled this quote because I, I thought it was, I'd never really thought about it this way. And I pulled it from uh, this book from by Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, um, talking about Jesus's death. Because um, did I mean obviously Jesus did not deserve to die. He had not sinned. Uh, death is only a thing because of sin. The wages of sin is death, but Jesus himself did not, did not die. And so I thought this was an interesting way to think about it. Uh, death has a claim on all of us because of our sin, but Jesus had no sin, and so the grave had no claim on him. Death went too far when it took hold of Jesus, and death lost its claim on all humanity. Death is destroyed. Jesus takes upon himself our death, the punishment for our sins, the condemnation that we deserve, and the wrath of God that our sin had kindled. He took it on himself so that our death no longer forever separates us from God. The Lord gives us salvation in the place of condemnation and and forgiveness in the place of judgment, life in the place of death. So death, when in, in in Jesus dying, death reached too far. Death claimed too much um, because Jesus had not sinned. He had no wages that deserved death. Um, and so in dying, uh, this is how Jesus has conquered death. Well, Satan, Satan gets overconfident, saying, oh, I could do this, I could do this, I'm going to ruin it all, and then he goes too far. And, I mean, and it, it's not a surprise to God, but so death has no claim on Jesus, and then he, here is the connection that we make, because, because death has no claim on Jesus— those who are in Jesus cannot ultimately be claimed by death. So it has no claim on you. Are you baptized? Yes, I am baptized. You're baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection. Death has no claim on you. Believe it or not. And that's what we keep saying, because I, well, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief, because I see yet we're burying another son, another daughter, but no, this one is in Jesus. And so we live by faith, not by sight, that, that Satan overreaches in trying to claim Christ in death. And so, so Satan gets prideful, and, and God undoes it. Yeah, it's through death, his own, through Jesus' death, that God undoes death. Uh, and as you said, Pastor Choi, in our baptism, we have been united to, united to Jesus' own death and resurrection. Um, and so for us, even though we still die, uh, and that's still is sad and tragic. There's no guarantee I'm going to die. More, more, more than likely. <laughs> well, I don't know. Jesus hey. can come back right uh, now. He could. He could. Uh, yeah. But uh, that's not the end of the story. Um, yeah. uh, there's a hymn. I think we just sang it. Death becomes the portal to... Um, I don't know what the words are. I don't know. But death, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting that... God takes something as awful and tragic as death, but he uses it to undo it. Oh, what you meant for evil. Yeah. I'll use for my... Pr- I mean, and, and, yeah, and so in the end, we overcome... Oh, evil is overcome with good. And then there are things that are objectively evil, and there are things that are objectively good. How do you know that? Well, I have to know that in and through Jesus. Great. So if Satan had been smart, he would have been in the crowd yelling, let him go, let him go, let him go. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, when you think about that, it means that God even directed Satan to direct the crowd to yell, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Maybe not direct it, but definitely allow it. And allow it to go to that. Not only allow it, but or preordained it. I mean, it was going to happen. But if Satan had been in the crowd yelling, let him go, and Jesus had been let go, God would have still accomplished his purpose, but we wouldn't be reading the same New Testament type of story. Well, that's what's so amazing. And, and Martin Luther talks about this in the life of the Christian, in that, uh, um, you know, suffering, the stuff that Satan wants to use, uh, use against us to destroy us, often becomes that which actually strengthens our faith, that actually which points us, brings us, connects us back to Jesus, that all that junk um, God uses and flips it against Satan. Uh, and so Satan becomes a clown, basically, because Satan is like, I want to use death to, to destroy the Son of God, but in doing so, he actually destroyed himself. Well, he didn't destroy it, but uh, God destroyed him through this thing that Satan wanted. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you were, you were so God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. Um, God is perfectly rational. I, I think is the correct statement. I mean, God does not do things that are irrational um, because he's a God of order and there's a connection to things. But sin is not rational. So I think when you said, Rick, well, if Satan was rational, he would have – well, he's not rational. And the crowd is not rational because it's a, it's a, it's it's uh, we see this not only in our own lives, but we see it in the extreme with addiction. If you do this, it will destroy you. Okay, I'll do it then. Right? I mean, and so Satan can't help himself in that. I mean, the crowd can't help themselves. We, left to our own devices, can't help ourselves. And, and then I think if we're honest, we look at the world and we say, look at this, <laughs> this rioting and looting. That's just the natural condition of humanity is to riot and loot. And you say, well, look, if, you, if you're logical about this, it doesn't make any sense. Well, it doesn't but we're not rational creatures, so God comes and is going to undo it. But, but the only ultimate hope for justice and renewal and peace is all in Jesus. So it's, I mean, I think there's a beauty with that uh, that, that comes up. There's a, I want to, Lois uh, asked a question here on Facebook. Isn't there something also in Scripture that says all sins will be known at the judgment? You're, the, you're in charge of this. <laughs> Well, no, I would open it up to the crowd. Yeah. No, I think I think there is. I, mean, I think there is. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, you're going to God. Nothing is a surprise to God, and so I think all the more wonderful that God says, "In and through my Son, I'm not going to hold this against you." We can't believe it. Well, I hold everything against everybody. I hold everything against myself. I hold things against God. You're not like me, God. No, I'm not, and that's mm -hmm. a good thing. And so I, I think it's, it is unbelievable because it is contrary to our sinful nature. Yeah. Margaret Hudson. Well, you yeah. have to piggyback on what Rick was saying about the crowd, you know, saying crucifying, crucifying. Isn't it awesome that then after the apostles received the Holy Spirit, when Peter preached to the crowd right. and said, look what you did, you crucified. <laughs> you know, the you, Lord you ended, killed the Lord of life. The majority, majority of them, I mean, thousands of them repented. And isn't yeah. it wonderful how... God provided them that way out after they had just said the worst thing in the world. You know? the, 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 the crowds are chilling on the one hand, though, because, I mean, so that, that's the remarkable thing, that the crowds didn't do what then they would turn around and do to St. Stephen, who points to Jesus, and they hate that, and they kill him. And you, I mean, I, I, on the one hand, I am terrified of mobs, and I see it all around me, and I think that's the point. Hey, you want to see the way? This is what... Might makes right, and you can whip people into a frenzy who probably don't even realize what they're doing, because I think if you could take them off and individually say, look what you were doing, they would then, guided by the Holy Spirit, and that's the remarkable thing about a th thousands of people who say, oh no, I'm sorry, I repent, I'm cut to the heart, what can I do? Well, believe. That's pretty cool. I'm sorry, that, that, dis that discussion we have every once in a while in here about what we were taught when we were growing up, it came to mind with that discussion about isn't God going to know our sins 
when we stand in front of him. And that's what some of us remember being taught by pastors and old German <laughs> theologians that, that, you know, when you get to heaven, God is going to call you to account for all of those things that you did. And, and I remember as a kid listening to that, thinking I'm going to have to remember why I did it and <laughs> try to come up with some kind of excuse for it. But what that negates is certainly God will... God in his all-knowingness will know, but it's the verse that we missed it that says God chooses not to remember them when we are in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so if I if I die that the moment I pass and I am in Christ, what God is looking at is Christ in me, not, not that pile of sins. Now, if I die and I'm not in Christ, am I right in saying that then what he's looking at is all of the not other Christ. stuff? And that's where... I'm off to the left or off to the right. But if I die in Christ, and that's where Paul in Romans gets so angry because he keeps talking about, well, all of those sins are forgiven when you are in Christ. And then in Galatians, really said, well, then I might as well keep on sinning because the more I sin, the more he can <laughs> right. forgive me. And that, that does, but the idea that, yeah, God's going to know the sum total of our life on earth. But in Christ, the only thing he's looking at is Jesus. That's the only thing that matters at the moment that we see him. I mean, it, God already knows all of our sin. <laughs> um, but he also already, when he sees us, he's, he sees Christ. Uh, for the baptized child of God, we are robed in Christ's righteousness. Uh, I'm sorry, I, it reminds me of another family story. <laughs> My sister's listening, forgive me. I don't know if they're on here, but uh, yeah, I've, I've made sure the microphone is hot. <laughs> yeah. This is Rick Kerr. I remember when my father died in 1987, and it was a very sad time for all of us. And I was walking in the driveway with my youngest sister, who, who was pregnant at the time. And I remember her talking about how, well, at least dad will be in heaven, and he'll see his grandson be born, and he'll, he'll know all of this. And I remember stopping, and I wasn't particularly spiritual at that time. But I remember telling her, I said, you know what I don't like about that thought? Is if dad's going to see the grandson being born, then that means he sees me every time I go behind the barn and sin. You know, and I'm not sure I want to kind of look at it that way. I would prefer to think that dad's just there in heaven, kind of oblivious to us because he's looking at Jesus. Why would he be looking down here at that point? But it's, that's another one of those things about what God knows and what people are able to understand in heaven, and we, we can't even begin to fathom what it's going to be like. like a, lot, a lot of us will say, when I get to heaven, I've got these 10 questions I want to ask God. And I think that when I get to heaven, I'll take the 10 questions, and the minute I see him, I'm going to go, whoa. <laughs> it's like all the questions are gone. It's like there's nothing left except looking at that at the light who is Jesus. Yeah, I... I was struck a couple of years ago, I was having a conversation about theories of the end of the world, what different religions think about how the world's going to end. And somebody, my brother-in-law asked me, what, what, what is, uh, you know, the Christian um, kind of the overview of the end of the world? And, and somebody said, uh, oh, God's wrath, which, yes, uh, God is going to come and put an end to sin and all that. But... Uh, it just kind of struck me. I mean, that's kind of how we typically think of the end of the world, isn't it? Like God's going to come back and he's angry. He's ticked. He's going to, you know, judgment, all that stuff. Which, well, I think it's why you'd be afraid of it. Yeah. But I think it just kind of struck me like for the Christian, when Jesus comes back, the end of this world, like it's not just judgment. It's restoration, recreation, redemption, probably other R words, but, uh, uh, the wiping away of tears yeah. of, of sorrow. Yeah, and so I think kind of going back to Lois's question, yes, uh, all sin is going to be known. I mean, all sin is already known, but I think that's kind of focusing on the wrong wrong thing. Like, uh, when Christ returns, like, all that it would be today. <laughs> um Everything, I mean, it's just going to be wonderful. And I, th I, think, I think one of Satan's tricks on us is to get us to think that the next, uh, n um, the new creation, he's gotten us to dread it in one way or another. Like, oh, I got to live my life now. Well, he's the father or, of lies. Or, to, uh, to lose focus of the main thing. Heaven's going to be boring or I can't 
I got to live my life before I die. I mean, all these things like, and I, and I just had this conversation with the seventh graders this week that when Christ comes back, like I'll actually finally be able to live life the way I'm supposed to all the time. And how awesome and amazing is that going to be? Well, yeah, I think Satan, the father of lies, wants to flip everything around. And so it is, I mean, to, to call death life and life death. And, and so then to rob us of ultimate hope is, is, is really a master stroke. And to say, and this is then living by faith is saying, I know that in the end, everything is going to be okay. And waiting is not pointless because if, if any, I think, I mean, pointlessness is, is a terrible thing. Yeah. Like what, it, if I have no purpose, then why am I here? And if there's a creator, why did he create me to have no purpose? So even waiting has a purpose and God is using that waiting to teach us things. And it is in the waiting and to then, save others. yeah. And how do I wait? I could wait with resentment and I could wait with, with um, boredom and I could, or I can wait with hope and say, yeah, God has put me here to do this. And so then I can see everything rightly. And so it's like, Hey, look, you know, in the end, death doesn't have a claim on me. And so Lord have mercy. I'm afraid of the mob. If the mob comes and tears down my house and I was going to use some hurts my wife and kids and takes all my stuff away and even takes my life. Well, you know what? God's going to undo that too. It's going to be okay. You know what? And it doesn't matter to me in the end, in an ultimate sense, if Joe Biden is president or Donald Trump or if, uh, Arlene, are you running this year? No. Okay. Arlene, Missouri. Uh, it, it, you know, Lord have mercy, even if it's a communist dictatorship, you know who ultimately is reigning? God is reigning. And even in the, in the church especially has flourished. Am I saying I want that? Not necessarily. Not at all. But if it happens, it's going to be okay. And so to then... That's where courage comes in, right? And this is where trust and hope and faith and courage and waiting, because all of it's centered in Jesus. And what we keep saying again and again, the reason that you can talk about and we can talk about our death is because in the end, it's going to be swallowed up in victory. And we can talk about it honestly. We don't have to pretend, oh, it's something else or you become an angel or whatever. We'll just call it what it is. Because you know what? God's got it under control, believe it or not. And I keep coming back to that, well, because, yeah, I believe, but I don't really believe it. And I need Pastor Luke to remind me, or Arlene, or Rick, or Vita. Vita's going to remind me. Yeah. Happy anniversary. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was thinking that no matter what happens, the word of God is not going to be suppressed. Amen. His people are not going to be suppressed. You may think they are, but they aren't. I mean, when you yeah. had, I was just thinking of Russia with communism and the pressure they had on the on them but yet God's word thrived yeah. in that we may not have seen it but it did thrive <clears throat> so you're not going to stamp out God's word even though Satan wants you to believe that it's over that God is dead right I mean and, and Satan believed because he overreaches oh they crucified him I've won well, no, you didn't, because he's risen. It has no claim, and now you're done. And so Satan fights all the more. Well, let me just delude other people into being miserable, because misery loves company. And yet we say, no, our hope is in Jesus. And then you say, well, hey, you're free. You are absolutely free. Like, don't, the, the, the tyranny, and I was listening to Pastor Fisk. Uh, uh, he's got a Saturday morning thing that he talks for two hours just by himself, so I can't. Your, well, your style of right, this is my style. But uh, I listened to it at one and a half speed. So, um, but he was talking about. I mean, and he he's kind of getting a little tinfoil hat maybe here. He said, uh, you know, health insurance. So we have a corporate structure where you have to have a job because you want to have health insurance because it's really expensive. Is this kind of a form of servitude? What if you could just be free to not have to have? You, well, I have to keep my job. I can't say this or do the wrong thing because I'd lose my health insurance. He says, well, what if you were just free? What if you didn't have to have to keep a job you didn't want because you have to have health insurance? He said, because, you know, maybe we're afraid that God's not going to take care of us. we got to have this health. Now, and he's not saying I'm he's not. He says, I'm not saying go out and quit your job and not have health insurance. But there is kind of a tyranny because do, do you really believe that God is going to swallow this up? So I'm still working through that. 
Rick's getting rid of his health insurance. No, no. No, no I have Medicare. Okay, yeah, that's right. The government's got you taken care of. Uh, yeah. Which is why you have a supplement. That's right. Yeah, yeah. No, just going to, to Vita's point, if you when you read some of the uh, Christian news wires, some of the Christian news organizations, it's fascinating that what you'll never see on the nightly news is the fact that in Portland, in Seattle, there are evangelists all over the streets in those towns. And if, whether you believe in this style of preaching or whatever, but there are stories of revivals going on in that there are people on the ground in those cities preaching and evangelizing, and people are... If I can use the word coming to Christ, and the faith is, is, I mean, you're seeing people come that direction, and you're right. I mean, no matter how bad it gets, God's word is, God's word is still is still there, and it's still working and, and making a difference. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I am convinced that, I mean, you know, as Christians, as the church at large, I mean, we got our stuff to figure out. We got problems. Not here at St. John, of course, but... Uh, Everybody else does. Uh, everyone else. Yeah. But uh, I am convinced God's people, by and large, are doing the things that God's people ought to be doing. And um, I know many of you heard it, but the story of the West Falls. Um, you know, I just heard, learned this story a week ago. That is God's people doing what God's people need to be doing. Um, as tragic and awful as that situation was and continue to be for the rest of Ryan's life, uh, God's word is not going to be suppressed. Uh, God's kingdom is still on the move, and it's through these these small, sometimes big actions of just Christians doing what Christians need to do or supposed to do. Um, Christians overcoming evil with good. And he says, "My power is made perfect in weakness," and I don't know if he can get any weaker than being dead, right? So then, oh, the the, the power of God is that I now I hold all things. And in your weakness where if you didn't believe it before, now that you're dead or the person you love is dead, Christ will raise this one. God will undo this. That, that takes faith to believe that. Back, back, Lois's uh, question here about the judge. She says, in other words, the mental picture of standing before a judge, God, listening to all of our sins being laid out can be discarded. I think. Well, all, in an it, ultimate sense. Well, it's maybe. already It's already for the Christian it's already been laid out on the cross. Well, yeah, and so so even if you were in the courtroom, I mean, this is this this uh, courtroom language, and God says, "Here's all your sins," and Satan Satan is the prosecuting attorney. There they all are, every single one. It's Jesus who steps in and says, "Yeah, I take the punishment," and then and it, I'll, I'll take it all. So, in the end, Satan has got nothing on you. I mean, we we still. We fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Sin kills. It's my sin that condemns me, but in the end, that doesn't have the final say. And in the end, it's just going to be swallowed up in victory. And death doesn't have the final say. Fi death doesn't have the final say. The wages of sin is death, and you don't have to pay it. But that doesn't Christ mean be a dork. Paid it. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, God says, I, re I remember their sin no more. Right. And then all of a sudden, on the last day, he's going to remember all those things that he forgot. No. He doesn't because sin goes to the cross to die, right? I mean, so this is why it is not actually, I mean, but the, the way that he does it is sacrificial. And it's, and, it, and it still is difficult for me because we've touched on it. I mean, it was forgive and forget. Well, God can forgive and forget. I have a really hard time forgetting. Like, I, no, I remember. I, I remember all the things. <laughs> I remember all the things. And, 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 and if I'm honest, I remember a lot of things that I, I'm hard on myself. Well, you dummy. And so... And Satan says, yeah, you are a dummy. And, and he says, no. So, so it is difficult for me to conceive, because I'm not God, that God actually does this. Because I am, by nature, vindictive and vengeful and w whatever other thing. Poor in spirit. Um, going back to that waiting, uh, um, I was just thinking, we were talking a, a couple weeks ago about um, saying... Um, uh, confessing our sins to each other. And so I've been meaning that, um, you know, in my prayers, really, like, really confessing my sins to God. And so, um, so do you think that sometimes, you know, if you're a Christian, you could be like, well, we're still waiting on Jesus to come back, but then you see other people, 
because if God was to come back, maybe I wouldn't be ready. So he's doing it as kind of like um, uh, being nice to me and other people that are trying they're trying to get ready, but they're not quite there yet. No. Well, my, my initial response is God is God does love you and is being nice to you if you want to use that term. Like so uh Jesus did die for you. Jesus did also die for your enemy. Everything's gonna work out in God's timing. So I think the danger is saying, Well, you know, did this happen so this other thing can happen? I don't know, ultimately, but is we always keep our focus on Jesus. And so and I, as you were talking about confessing sin, see, I think that's the other thing is the freedom that comes in saying, you can confess even your worst sin. Because Satan will want to tell you, you can confess some sins, but not others. And you can certainly point out everybody else's sins. But no, I can actually confess this sin, the deepest one. And then God doesn't... If yeah. I was still waiting and I wasn't trusting, right. then I wouldn't have been able to... I mean, I was crying. David, sure. my husband, was like, Amy, what's wrong? <laughs> right. And I told him, because he knows yeah. me. I mean, we've been together since we were 17. And these are fear. I mean, I can tell you guys, my biggest sin that I confess to God, my nephew is an addict. He's 19 years old. And when he was 13, I had a chance to take him. And I didn't. And I chose myself in my family and so so those so anyways um if i wasn't waiting then i wouldn't have been able to confess that that's what i'm trying to say i think um as christians a lot of times as christians we are very good at beating ourselves up um no, 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 you're fine. You're fine. This is this is this is good to talk through because uh, I actually had a similar conversation with a student here this week. Um, he he was wondering, are these things happening because I don't have enough faith? <laughs> and I really empathize with the kid because, I mean, I have believed that lie most of my life, <laughs> um, that God doesn't actually love me, that I'm I'm a terrible person. You don't deserve anything. I don't deserve anything, which on the one hand is, is it's true, true. You don't. True. But I mean, that's what Satan wants us to believe, these kind of things, that I am only a miserable sinner. I am only a wretch. I am only whatever. But I am a baptized child of God. And this kid that I, I was talking to, I know is a baptized child of God. I know he believes. And I told him, I know it doesn't feel like it, but God is with you, and God still loves you. Uh, and because I was talking to a junior high boy, uh, knowing my audience, I told him, these are lies from Satan. He wants you to believe this about yourself. He wants you to believe you don't have enough faith or whatever. When you have these thoughts or feelings, you have my permission to tell Satan to earmuffs, screw off. So... <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and I got a smile out of him. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, yeah. That's a better, uh, use because, the King James. <laughs> because, I mean, that's what Satan wants us to believe. And, you know, as ba baptized children of God, you know, God sees, he doesn't see our sin. He sees Christ's righteousness. He sees Jesus. And if that's how God sees us, God the Father sees us this way, to quote one of my favorite professors at the seminary, Robert Kolb, maybe it's okay for me to look at myself that way too. Yeah, and you, and so it's like, look, look, uh, it's not about you, and that's that may be law, and then that should be gospel. It's about Jesus. Like, believe it or not, you're not the hero of your story. Oh shucks, I wanted to be that. No, it's actually a good thing because I'm a terrible hero. I'm actually a villain in that sense. I'm, I'm not exclusively a villain. Yeah, exclusively a villain. Rick, and then we'll wrap up because we're out of time, right? Oh. Yeah. I just want to say that I think we all fall victim to this kind of thinking. That this kind of thinking is pulling us back into the wrong-headed idea that somehow we're in charge. That we can make it okay, we can correct everything, uh, or we can't, and it's our fault that we can't. We are a fault. Uh, we don't deserve it. But Jesus loves us despite that, and he has canceled all that out. And as yeah. far as getting ready, uh, I sympathize with you. I've had the same thoughts, but we got ready 
that. Yeah, and I think that that you're not in charge is back to where the trust and patience comes in. You're not in charge. Peggy, and then we'll wrap up. I was going to say, follow up with Rick. You are already ready. Nothing you can say or do will change To, to quote uh, Dirk Reek again, Peggy, <laughs> uh, he was one, you know, a son of this congregation and one of my favorite professors in college. Like, when you are baptized in Christ, you are wrapped in Christ's righteousness. You can't improve on that. We can't do it. Um, God loves us in spite of our failures, and we all have made terrible mistakes. God loves us anyway. And the God who conquered death on our behalf is certainly going to forgive us. All right. I want to have the last word and pray. No, we'll give Jesus the last word, but let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent Jesus, the one who is our Savior, who, uh, who died but is risen. And because he lives, we have life in him. And in the end, death will be swallowed up in victory. So strengthen our faith. Thank you for the opportunity that we have as we gather together today. And uh, as we wait, and maybe today's the day, we know that we wait with hope because Jesus is the hero of our story. In his name we pray. Amen.